Okay, in this video we're going to talk about just some of the concepts that are associated with whole muscle contraction. So it turns out the same principles apply to contraction of both single fibers and entire muscles. Well, since entire muscles are made of lots of single fibers, you know, it makes sense. And uh, the contraction produces muscle tension. And tension is basically the force that's exerted on a load or object to be moved. Now the contraction may or may not shorten the actual muscle. An example of this is an isometric contraction where our muscles can produce tension without a significant amount of shortening. And this is actually where the tension increases but does not exceed the load. That way the muscles don't change in length. Isotonic contraction is where the muscle shortens because the muscle tension it does exceed the load. And so uh, force and duration of contraction can vary in response to the amount of stimuli as well as the frequency of stimuli intensities, and uh, each muscle is served by at least one motor nerve. Motor nerves contain axons of up to hundreds of different motor neurons, and these axons can branch into terminals, each of which forms a neuromuscular junction with uh, single muscle fibers. Now, motor units are the nerve to muscle functional unit. So an example of a motor unit is basically where we have a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it supplies. So the smaller the fiber number, the greater the fine control and the weaker the amount of contraction that's going to be able to be produced. So larger motor units have larger fiber numbers and gross motor control. Small motor units have smaller numbers of muscle fibers they connect to and therefore more fine motor control. So muscle fibers from a motor unit are spread throughout the whole muscle and stimulation of a single motor unit usually causes very weak muscle contractions. So what this is showing are two different motor units. We have motor unit one and two. One is the purple one, two is the, is the red one. And we see that the axon from motor unit one goes to only two muscle fibers, whereas the axon from motor unit two branches and connects to three muscle fibers. So motor unit one is going to be the smaller motor unit because it connects to less muscle fibers. But that means it's also going to be under more fine motor control because it, you know, it connects to less fibers and therefore provides a, you know, a weaker contraction, which is better for more fine muscle movements. Motor unit two, because it connects to more muscle fibers, won't be as fine. In fact, it's going to connect to more muscle fibers, which actually causes a more strong contraction. And what's pretty cool is our nervous system can control motor units specific to the type of action that's necessary. So uh, let's say if you just want to like take notes by you know using your pen, you're going to use smaller motor units like that of you know motor unit one. Otherwise, if you want to lift like a burning car off of somebody, you know you might want to use motor unit one and two. That way, you can actually can contract a lot of different muscle fibers to produce a more maximal amount of force. Now, muscle twitches are the simplest contraction that result from a muscle fiber's response to a single action potential. Muscle fibers contract quickly and then relax a little bit more slowly. Now, these twitches can be actually be observed and recorded as a myogram. Myo meaning muscle, gram meaning graph. And we get a trace or a line recording of contraction activity. So these myograms occur in three phases. We have a latent period, a period of contraction, and a period of relaxation. The latent period is the, is the period of delay between uh, the stimulus and the onset of a muscle contraction. This is where you don't see any tension produced. Now the period of contraction is when the cross bridge is formed and tension starts to increase. And the period of relaxation is when calcium reentry back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, causes a relaxation and tension starts to decline towards zero. And it turns out that muscles contract faster than they relax because it's easier to release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum causing contraction and tension than it is to pump that calcium back into the SR. That takes longer, which is why uh, the relaxation period is longer on the myogram. So this is showing a myogram where we have time in milliseconds over uh, maximum tension here. So this is showing one muscle twitch where we have a stimulus at time zero and that period of delay between the stimulus and the onset of tension is basically our latent period. This latent period is the period of time it takes for action potentials to spread down the T tubules, you know, and also causing calcium to be released from the SR and then uh, eventually leading to enough cross bridges where you have a measurable amount of tension. And all of that occurs within this latent period, which is in the order of several milliseconds.
Now this period here where you get a rapid increase in tension is the contraction phase. This is actually going to be due to that rapid rise in calcium from SR and that calcium then allows for lots of myosin heads to form cross bridges with actin which is why we see a rapid rise in tension. Now this period of contraction continues until eventually we start to get a period of relaxation where uh, calcium is pumped back into the SR and because that calcium is being pumped back in the SR, you know, troponin is going to start to relax and allow for tropomyosin to cover the actin binding sites, which allow for the myosin heads to, you know, relax and, you know, prevents cross bridges from being formed, which is why we see tension start to decline over time and, uh, here until eventually tension goes back towards zero. Now, the reason why the period of relaxation is longer than the period of contraction is that it takes longer for calcium to be pumped back into the SR than it is for calcium to be released. And that's why we see a, a difference in the slope of these lines in the period of contraction versus relaxation. Now, the differences in strength and duration of twitches are due to variations in the metabolic properties of enzymes between muscles. So it turns out that not all muscles twitch the same way. Some twitch more rapidly, some twitch more slowly. It also de depends on the types of molecules you find in those cells. So for instance, eye muscles have a rapid type of twitch, which is brief, whereas larger fleshy muscles like your calf muscles contract more slowly and can hold the contraction longer. So this is showing that the twitch duration in different muscles are in your body, like the soleus and gastrocnemius are some of your calf muscles. And you can see that these calf muscles have much longer twitches than say the extraocular muscles of your eyes, because for one, they're going to be involved in kind of longer and slower gross motor movements. Whereas the extraocular muscles, because they need to produce pretty rapid eye movements, their twitches are rapid. And um, ultimately what, what underlies the difference between these, the twitch duration is how quickly calcium is released from the SR and also how quickly it's pumped back in. So we're seeing here is that with the slower twitch fibers, you know, calcium is going to be released more slowly and it's actually going to be pumped back into the SR also more slowly, which results in a much longer muscle twitch. And it actually makes sense for this, the way this muscle needs to be used. Now, in terms of muscle responses, we find that you know, normal muscle contractions are pretty smooth, and the strength varies with the needs of that muscle. And so muscle twitches, uh, which you see in a lab, are going to be you know, just individual myogram muscle twitches, but you don't find this in normal muscle. Normally in living muscle that's, you know, in, in an organism, you find that, that muscles are going to be a more of a graded response where multiple muscle twitches add together, which can uh, kind of, you know, provide different properties for the demands of that muscle. Now the responses are graded by changing the frequency of stimulation of that muscle and changing the strength of stimulation. So if you have more frequent stimulation, you're going to get stronger muscle contraction. Or if you also have a stronger stimulus, you're also going to, get, going to get a stronger muscle contraction. So what this is showing is, you know, one stimulus and then one muscle twitch, like we saw in the myogram earlier. And uh, this can actually start to add together when you have uh, wave or temporal summation, where muscle twitches can start to summate or add together as long as you have um, stimuli in rapid succession. In fact, muscle fibers don't have the time to completely relax, which means that these twitches increase in force with each stimulus. And this is because calcium is released um, more and more so with the second stimulus. Now, this produces a smooth, continuous contraction that adds up or summates, and further increases in stimulus frequency can cause the muscle to you know, lead to uh, a quivering type of contraction that's sustained. We call this unfused or incomplete tetanus. So what this is showing is more of a low stimulation frequency, which we call unfused or incomplete tetanus. So each little arrow here is showing one stimulus, and you can see we get a stimulus and a twitch. But before this first twitch can fully relax, we get another stimulus, which causes another twitch. And because it didn't fully relax, that second twitch added on to the first, which caused your maximal tension to be higher than the first. And because the second twitch didn't fully relax before our next stimulus here, then it adds on to that one and adds on to that one until eventually we get tension that's even greater than the initial um, you know, twitch itself because of the summation or addition of the tension that's produced by each stimulus um, on the muscle. And so this is going to get us to you know, a period of you know, even greater tension or muscle force that's able to, to, to be produced. Now muscle responses can also um, 
be due to a change in, in stimulus frequency. And if stimulus frequency increases, muscle tension can reach a maximum. And we call this fused or complete tetanus because contractions fuse into one smooth, sustained contraction plateau. And what determines this contraction plateau is basically just the number of sarcomeres you find in that muscle. Eventually, you're going to run out of sarcomeres that are completely contracted, which is going to cause the maximal amount of tension that's able to be produced by that muscle. So what this is showing is if you actually have lots of stimuli or action potentials in rapid succession, we see that there's a really rapid increase in tension up to a plateau. And this plateau is the maximal amount of tension that you can produce in this muscle until once you have the last stimulus, which then allows for relaxation to occur. So this is an example of complete or fused tetanus. So muscle responses to a change in stimulus can also be due to recruitment. And recruitment is where you have multiple motor units that can lead to summation. Now there's uh, different types of stimulus that can lead to recruitment, like subthreshold, threshold, and maximal stimulus. And a subthreshold stimulus is a stimulus that is not strong enough to lead to a contraction. That's why it's subthreshold, because you get a stimulus but no corresponding muscle contraction. A threshold stimulus is the, is the minimum amount of stimulus required to cause a first observable muscle contraction. And a maximal stimulus is the strongest stimulus that increases the maximum contractile force. Now that is illustrated well by this graph, where these arrows represent the size of the stimulus. And you can see that one, two are basically sub-threshold because, yes, they are a stimulus. However, they don't actually recruit any muscle fibers to contract, which is why we don't see any tension produced. Now, st stimulus number three is called a threshold stimulus because this is the first observable sign of contraction where you do recruit some fibers and you get a little bit of muscle contraction that's, that's uh, you know, produced. Now, upon subsequent st uh, stimulation increases, we do see an increase in tension until eventually we get to a point where there's a maximal stimulus. And the maximal stimulus means that you've recruited as many muscle fibers as you can in this muscle which means that increasing stimulus intensity doesn't cause an increase in uh, amount of tension that's produced by that muscle. This is why it's a maximal stimulus, where getting stronger stimuli doesn't lead to even stronger tension. Because ultimately, you've reached the peak amount of tension that's able to be produced by this muscle because you've recruited all of the muscle fibers in that muscle. So one and two are examples of sub-threshold stimuli. Number three is an example of a threshold stimulus, which is the minimum amount of stimulus required to cause a muscle to contract. And then number seven here is an example of maximal stimulus, which is the, um, the last type of stimulus that can lead to the greatest amount of uh, muscle contraction produced by that muscle. Now, uh, muscle changes can also, sorry, muscle responses can also change due to st stimulation strength. And it turns out that fibers are recruited based on size principle. So that the smaller muscle fibers are recruited first, larger muscle fibers are recruited last. And so motor units with the smallest muscle fibers are the ones that are recruited first, and the motor units with larger and larger fibers are recruited uh, last because of um, you know, a resistance to uh, stimulation. Now, what we see then, and it actually makes sense, is that motor units with the smaller muscle fibers are, are, are recruited first, or stimulated first, which means you get smaller uh, contraction initially, but as you start to increase the stimulus, you get larger and larger muscle contractions because larger muscle fibers are therefore recruited. And this makes sense with respect to how muscle should be used because you don't want to have the maximal amount of tension being produced initially. You want to start with the smaller motor units and then work your way up to a maximal amount of, you know, tension. So, uh, physiologically, this idea of muscle tone is a constant slightly contracted state of all muscles. And it's actually due to spinal reflexes where groups of motor units are alternatively activated in response to input from stretch receptors and it helps keep muscles firm, healthy, and readily, ready to respond. Now, uh, earlier we talked about the isotonic and isometric contractions. Remember, isotonic contraction is basically where you have a change in the muscle length because of the load moving and causing a change in the length of your muscle. Now, isotonic contractions can either be concentric or eccentric. Concentric contractions where the muscle shortens as it does work. An example of this is like when your biceps contract to pick up a book, where your biceps can actually produce more force than the load or that, the weight of that book, and that way the muscle shortens as it produces work. That's concentric. And an eccentric contraction is like the muscle lengthens 
as it generates this force, this would be like laying a book down. As the biceps relaxes, it actually has a little bit less tension or force than the load of that book. So an example of this, like an isotonic contraction, is basically where the muscle contracts and it shortens as it contracts, which allows you to kind of pick up that load. And this example is a three kilogram, kilogram block. So if you can measure this, um, you know, experimentally, we see that, you know, tensions developed. We get a peak amount of tension that's developed by that muscle, and that actually causes, you know, muscle length to uh, decrease uh, in response to that tension. And this is an example of, an, of a concentric isotonic contraction. Opposite of this, we, we actually have isometric contractions. And isometric contraction is basically where the uh, load is greater than the maximum tension that the muscle can generate. So the muscle neither shortens nor lengthens. And what we find then is that, um, you know, isometric contractions would be like where if you can just hold a book out in air and your arm's not changing length at all and the muscle's not changing length at all and therefore you're just adequately resisting that load the muscle's not changing length, and it doesn't. The muscle doesn't shorten or lengthen. So um, the way we get get isotonic and isometric contractions is that um, in isotonic contractions, actin filaments shorten and cause movement. In isometric contractions, the cross bridges generate force, but the actin filaments don't change their position. They don't change their length, um, and therefore don't shorten. And this is where the myosin heads kind of just spin their wheels in the same position, which keeps the the sarcomere is the same length. So with an isometric contraction, you're helping to resist the load, but this muscle's not changing length. So you're actually help, you can hold this, this block up in space, but the muscle doesn't change its length, which is isometric or same um, distance. So with an isometric contraction, yes, you're producing a peak amount of tension, but you're not changing the length of that muscle.